Good evening everybody, welcome to another video here on my channel. I will apologise that this hasn't actually come out on a Thursday when it should have done. Unfortunately the kids have been running me riot as it is the school holidays at the minute. So kind of pulling my hair out <laughs> with them. So unfortunately this has come out a day late. Um, the video I'm actually going to do today, tonight for you, as you can see, it's quite dark outside so it is pretty late at night. Um, the video that I'm going to do for you tonight is actually a video that was suggested to me by one of my students and it wasn't one I'd actually thought of to begin with um, and what they wanted me to do was a video all about how you can fail the driving test. Now that was their words that they used to me. Personally the reason why I hadn't thought of this is because I'm a very very big believer in the fact that if you go into that test wondering how you're going to fail it the outcome is already pretty much assured because if you have that negative attitude going into it generally the result that you're going to get coming out of it is going to be negative as well. But I do understand the point because we had a little bit of a chat about it and I was kind of trying to figure out what she wanted to get out of that video and she basically said to me she wanted to understand in a nutshell how the test is actually marked so that for me is a very very good point and it is something that I know a lot of you out there don't fully understand how the test actually is going to be marked so when people are getting the feedback at the end of the test generally they're not in the right plate peace of mind to be able to actually take in the information and try and learn from it but that's the point that they really need to listen to it and it's very very important and i say this to all of my students at the point where you're going to get your results i want to be there to hear it if you've done really well brilliant i can celebrate with you if you've not done quite so well I'm the person at that point that is actually going to take that information in and I can develop that plan going forwards for you. Whether you're with a proper instructor or whether you're with an accompanied driver, somebody like a family or friend, always make sure they are there at the debrief at the end of your driving test because they will be able to take the information in and in a day or two when it's actually settled down and you've kind of calmed down from it, they'll be able to help you to improve that next time. Okay guys, so before I get into this video, I do want to apologise now that this is going to be a slightly long-winded video. There is a lot of information I want to give you in this one video. I could have split it down into multiple ones, but as it's all about the driving test, I've just done it as one whole video. And I do go through every single section of the driving test that is important for you to know before going for it. So do make sure you stay and watch to the end. If this is the first time coming to the channel, do make sure that you subscribe to the channel as well and turn on the bell notification so you don't miss any of the future videos coming up. Also, come and join me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, wherever you want to. If you've got any questions, you're more than welcome to drop me a message on there and as soon as I can, I will answer them as quick as you can. The link for all the socials is down in the description below for you. I've also put a link in the description for a copy of the driving test form so you can download and print one yourself. You can have a look through all the stuff that I'm going through here. Do make sure you stick to the end and make sure you watch all of it so that you get all the notes that you want. Whilst we're on the subject of notes, before you start watching this video, just give it a quick pause. Go and grab yourself a notepad and a pen because you are going to want to make some notes on this. There is some good facts and good tips on how to understand how the test is marked so that you can make sure that you pass the test when you go for it. We're going to begin with helping you to understand the marking system on the driving test. It's a very, very simple system but it has a lot of little grey areas in it. And I'll explain why in a minute. It's not to try and catch you out. It's just the way that they have to mark the test has certain areas where certain faults can be recorded in every single section potentially. So you have three categories. You'll have driver faults, serious faults, and dangerous faults. Now a driver fault, traditionally, a lot of people know it as the minor. Unfortunately, if you deem that as a minor fault it kind of takes away from the fact that actually if that was a habit or if that was done all the time potentially that could be quite bad so it's we don't call it a minor fault we call it a driver fault driver faults are the bits that are marked within the slightly longer section on the driving test report so that they've got a bit of room because you can get a few of these if the situations arise they're not one mark and you failed. That is not the way that they work. 
But what they are looking at here is to make sure that these issues are not habits. Because if you're constantly getting in a 40 minute drive, the same mark in the same box four, five, six, seven times, that's kind of telling the examiner that you don't do it. Uh, using your mirrors, for example, you've got three different sections on using your mirrors. And if you never check your mirrors before you signal, well, that kind of tells the examiner that you never do it. So during the driving test, you might not have come across a situation that actually causes a major issue for you not doing it. But because the examiner sees it as habitual, it's a habit and you don't ever do it, the chances of you passing and then going and causing an issue because of that are quite high. So unfortunately, that is where those collection of driver faults will become a serious fault. A driver fault is something that in the situation you're in isn't perfect, isn't ideal, isn't the best way for us to do it. But it doesn't cause a major issue. It doesn't necessarily make anything unsafe. It's just not best practice. So it's one of them things that they allow a certain amount of them so that you can make these little silly mistakes because the nerves or whatever. It's some, It's sometimes silly little things as you check in a mirror after you've started to signal. And that can be a couple of times you can do that. So you can always get those little driver faults that aren't the end of the world. A serious fault, however, is where during your drive on your test, whatever that fault comes under as, the examiner has had to help you in some form or another. Or that situation in itself, with a slightly different set of circumstances, an extra car being there, car being a little bit closer to you, you being a little bit closer to a certain object, would have caused an accident. And what I mean by the examiner helping you out might not even be to do with the pedals. Um, for example, you're on a big multi-lane roundabout and you drift across into a lane that you weren't intending to go on and you do that without even looking into that lane to make sure it's safe. The examiner's responsibility at that point is to keep you safe. So what they're going to do is they're going to do the check for you. They're going to look over the shoulder. At that point, you haven't driven on your own. And if the examiner wasn't there, could that have been a potential crash? And the answer to that would be yes, because you have no idea what's over here. So you've got to make sure you look at that point. It would also be that they've used the dual controls for whatever reason. It might be that they've given you a verbal instruction to stop because they haven't felt like you're braking, approaching a parked car, a stop car, a red light, something like that, whatever it might be. Now, there are some times when the examiners might help out with little things like the sat-nav giving you a bit of a dodgy direction, or they know that you're approaching a set of lanes that are a little bit unusual. Uh, you might have to go straight on in the third lane or something daft like that, where the road markings are a bit unusual. Generally, most examiners would just help you out with that because it's local knowledge. It's not something they're going to expect you to know. So what they will do is they might just jump in and just say, oh, this app told you it's third exit because it counts this driveway as an exit. Just ignore that. It's your second one. Something like that they might help you out with. Dangerous fault. Because a dangerous fault itself means that if the examiner didn't intercede or if something didn't react quite the way that it was, another car avoided you, whatever it might be, you would have had an accident. Either a serious or a dangerous fault will instantly fail the test. Now, a little point to make on that. Even if you know you have done that serious fault, do not give up, do not stop. Keep trying to drive as well as you can, because although at that point you may have failed the driving test, you've still got an opportunity to learn from it. And what you don't want to do is get back to the driving test center, you're going through the report and you've got this one dangerous that failed you. And you've got 25 driver faults, of which 20 of them you never do. They are nothing like your normal driving, but you've just done it because you've given up and you've thought, you know what, stuff this, I'm just gonna drive around. I don't really care now, I know I failed. Because at that point, you've wasted the 62 pound for the test fee the cost, if you're with a driving instructor, of the time before the test, their time, their car, all of that lot, it's been a complete waste of money. But if you keep trying and that one dangerous fault is the only thing you've got on that sheet when you get back, yeah, it might be a bit of a kick in the teeth that you did that, but do you know what? That gives you what you need to work on. 
because you know that even when that stress, that pressure has got to you and you know you've made that problem and you know you've made that fault, but you've then carried on and driven perfectly, you know that all you have to do for the next test is not do that fault because everything else you did was right. Because of this video, because you've understood how the driving test marking system works, if you know, as you're going around the driving test, that you've made something that could have failed you the test, don't throw the rest of it away. And also be careful. Just because you understand how it's marked and you think you might have failed, you might be surprised. I'm going to give you a very little example here of somebody that I know, and I heard this story a little while ago in a test centre from another instructor. So there is a lady approaching, she's on a driving test, her driving instructor is sat in the back of the car. She is around about 600 yards away from the test centre, so within a minute of getting there. And as she comes down this 40 mile, a road, 40 mile an hour road, there is a set of traffic lights she has to go through to get back to the test centre. She has a car very close up behind her. As she gets to the line, the lights change to amber and she went through and carried on going. At that point, she thought she'd failed the test and she gave up. Unbeknownst to her, before that had happened, she hadn't had a single driver fault on her test. She had a complete clean sheet. She'd had a perfect drive. She then went over the next little roundabout, which is about 100 yards away, didn't even bother looking, and there was a car coming from her right, didn't signal coming off the roundabout, didn't signal right at the next road, and cut up another car at the next road. She got back to the test centre, and the examiner said to her, what happened to you at the lights? And she went, I know I failed. And the examiner actually turned around and said to her, you did nothing wrong. You couldn't have stopped. You were doing 40 miles an hour, or just a bit below it because you were reducing your speed for the corner, and that car behind you was too close. So you couldn't have stopped safely at that point. So what you did was the correct thing. You didn't even get a driver fault for it. The only thing the examiner said to her at that point is, it might be an idea just to plan that a little bit earlier in the future, but it wasn't an issue on this driving test. But then what she got was two serious and one dangerous fault in the next 600 yards of driving. She was absolutely kicking herself because all she had to do was not think that she'd failed a test and just carry on trying to prove that she could do it and she'd have got back and passed. So don't ever think during your driving test, oh God, I failed, I need to give up. Always believe in yourself until you're back and the examiner tells you whether you have passed or not passed. So fault escalation, this is the next part of just understanding how it's marked. And it's very simple, this. Any fault that you create or you do on your driving test can be marked in each single box, from driver fault to serious to dangerous. And I'll explain why. So if you're traveling relatively slowly and you get a bit too close to the curb and you tap it and then correct it and fix it off, that's not something you should be doing, but it's a driver fault. You've just got that a little bit too close to the curb. You've tapped it, you've realized you've dealt with it, but you're not going fast enough. You might be doing 10, 15 mile an hour, or you might be pulling over to stop because the examiner's asked you to do that and you just tap the curb. Not the end of the world. Okay, yes, you might have scraped a wheel or rubbed the tire a little bit, but you've done it at such a slow speed, it's not really caused a major issue. Still a driver fault because it's not something that you should be doing. You change that situation to a 30 mile an hour road and you're doing the speed limit or very close to it and you tap the curb and there's a pedestrian on the curb. Now again, you might tap it and fix it, pedestrian might jump out of the way. At that point, in a slightly different situation, pedestrian being closer to the road, you not reacting quick enough to it or even going a little bit faster, you potentially could have mounted the curb and had an accident with that pedestrian. So that becomes a serious. Now change the same situation again, tapping the curb, hitting the curb, getting too close to it on a 40 mile an hour road. Single carriageway, 40 mile an hour road, so you've got traffic coming at you at 40 miles an hour the opposite way. You hit the curb and then react quite extremely to it and swing the car the opposite way and you end up going into the wrong side of the road. Well, unless the examiner grabs the wheel or you react really, really fast to it, that's going to be a crash. There is very little way to avoid that. So that then becomes a dangerous fault. But it is effectively the same fault, it's just tapping the curb, hitting the curb, getting too close to it. It's exactly the same fault, just in three slightly different situations, could be marked in three different boxes. 
So don't assume you know what's been marked. But you do have to be aware that in certain situations, these faults can escalate and get marked higher up. Okay, so you have to remember from one of the previous videos that I did about your driving test is you have to remember the pillars of passing your driving test, which is your safety pillar and your observation pillar. And they realistically do create the basis of how to pass this test. And when you're thinking about it, a lot of times, as I'm going to go through the test in a second, you'll see a lot of them are all to do with observation. And it's all to do with the amount of traffic that are on the roads now. But these pillars that we talk about, you can't be safe on the road if you've not looked to see if it is safe. It's a very simple principle. And a lot of what I'm going to show you on the test marking sheet is all to do with the fact that if you've not looked, it's not safe. So I'm going to work through the test sheet, just go through each section nice and quick for you, just so you understand. So the first one you'll see is your eyesight. Now you may notice there is only a box in under the S column, which is your serious fault. And you might say to yourself, well, why is that? Very simple. Your examiner at the beginning of the test is going to ask you to read a number plate at the correct distance. If you can't do it without glasses or you're, you're wearing glasses or contact lenses and you still can't do it, you, either your prescription's incorrect, you need to get your eyes retested, but at that point you don't meet the basic legal minimum requirement to read a number plate at the spe specified distance so that therefore you're not safe to do the test. And it's a serious, it's an instant fail and the examiner will not take you out. So a little bit further down, below the manoeuvres, you will see vehicle checks. And these are just your tell me questions. So again, you've got a box for your driver faults, you've got a box for serious, and you've got a box for dangerous fault. A dangerous fault in this one could be something as simple as you've been asked to open the bonnet to check the oil. After you've done that, you've not put the bonnet down, you've left it propped up, and you've just walked in and started the car. You can't see where you're going. That's dangerous. A serious would be in that situation you don't close the bonnet properly so it's not clicked in and there's a potential for it to open on its own with the wind and everything else that could pull underneath it. A driver fault is just getting the question wrong. It happens, there's 14 of them. You might get the answer a bit muddled up. It doesn't have to be word for word perfect. As long as the examiner gets the gist that you know what you're looking at, fine. But if you don't, it's a driver fault. Some people do class the controlled stop, what a lot of you will know as the emergency stop as a maneuver, it's not. It is what it is. It's asking you to do a controlled stop. And you need to remember that phrase quite a lot. What we are asking you to do is stop in an emergency situation under full control. A minor could be something as simple as you brake really hard, but you let off the brake just a little bit at the end. Or we perform a small amount of steering. As serious in this one would be you don't brake hard enough. You steer quite a lot when you're doing it, which you shouldn't do, just keep the wheels nice and straight. Or when you go to move off, you don't check your blind spots. You need to remember when you do the controlled stop, the emergency stop, you are not stopping at the side of a road, you are stopping in the middle of the road. People can come from anywhere. Think about the reason why you've been asked to stop. Let's imagine this situation is in the real world and you've just had a football run out in front of you from a park. What's gonna follow the football? Well, it's generally gonna be a child. So at that point, your brakes are going to slam on because you're going to want to stop in an emergency. You're not going to want to hit that child. At that point, a lot of screeching from the tyres. It'll be very clear that you've done an emergency stop. So what do you think is going to follow the child out after you've done your emergency stop? And it will be the parent, potentially, or whoever's looking after them. But you have no idea where they're coming from. And you're in the middle of the road. Your heart's racing. Your adrenaline's going. And you just need to take that moment to pause. You've done the stop. At that point, the examiner is going to say, thank you very much. I won't ask you to do that again. Move on when it's safe to do so. At that point, what they're wanting you to do is a check over both blind spots because you're in the middle of the road. You do that, you won't get a driver fault. And a dangerous is basically either not stopping or just stopping. And when the examiner says go, forward looking without that, and a car comes around the outside of you, they have to stop you from hitting that car. So make sure you do your checks and you stop nice and quickly. So your manoeuvres, they've all got the same box in them. Control and observations. Think about it this way, safely and observations. It's a very simple marker. So what you have to think about here is your, your control, for example. Um, 
your parallel park, your bay park, pulling forwards, pulling up on the right, reversing back. You think about your control, it could be something as simple as um, when you first pull into the parking bay, you're not in it completely, so you have to reverse back out or drive forwards out, depending on whether you've driven in or reversed in. You're not quite in the bay, so you have to correct it. You have to do what we call a shunt and then correct it. That's a driver fault because you've not done it perfectly. It's not the end of the world to do. I would always rather my students do that than end up in two bays and fail it based on that. It's always easier just to do that little shunt. Could be just reversing back on the parallel park, tapping the curb, pulled up on the right as you're reversing back, a little bit of steering goes on by accident, you just rub the curb a little bit. That then is just a driver fault. It's not like it's going to cause anybody any heartache. It's just not perfectly done. A serious on these ones could be something as simple as you reverse back into the parking space, you pick up too much speed and the examiner doesn't feel that you're going to stop before whatever is behind you and has to put the brake on. They've taken control. Could be a serious. Serious could also be if you have to shunt the car more than three times because at that point the examiner is then sitting there thinking they haven't realistically got the control to be able to do this in a real world situation. And a dangerous would be very simple of you go to do your parallel park let's say you put your first bit of turning on way too early and you're just about to hit the car that you're trying to park behind the examiner's going to have to stop you it's dangerous that's not what they want to do your observations for this are very very important this is where they are looking to see how aware you are of what's going on around you and not just looking reacting to what you see you go to do the parallel park front of your car swings out at that point you're blocking most of the road if you've not looked over your right shoulder or paid attention to a car coming from in front of you and you've just swung the front of the car and then that car has to slam its brakes on or this car's trying to squeeze around you and as you swing the front of the car around they have to slam the brakes on you've not been observant you've affected another road using negatively so that's going to become a serious missing the odd mirror check on it could just be a driver fault but you have to be careful because some of these can drop massively straight into the serious fault. Same with doing your reverse bay parking. No matter how you do it, whether you do it angled, whether you do the three bay technique, when you start swinging the front of the car round, you're effectively taking up a lot more space in that road that you're in. And you need to be looking, whether you're doing it on the right or the left, you need to be looking at whichever way the front of the car is swinging because that's where your danger is going to come from and not just fixating in one mirror. I see that quite a lot with people. They'll just sit there and stare in the mirror going, yep, yeah, I'm all right, I'm all right, I'm all right. They've missed the three babies over here that they've run over, and they've missed the pedestrian behind them that they've run over, but they're all right because they've looked in the mirror. But that mirror only shows them a small bit. So you need to just literally keep your head nice and checking all around you. And it's why I tell all my students to do this. All your maneuvers need to be done at a very drunken granny's walking pace. So as slow as you possibly can. Imagine you're as drunk as you can be. How slow do you stumble and stutter around? If you're moving the car faster than that, you are going too fast because you're not giving yourself time to do all your observations. So your maneuvers, observant, be as observant as you can. You've got a lot of chance of, if you're not observant, having these observations marked down as a serious. You control as long as you're nice and slow and you control the car, don't let the con car control you. The section at the bottom is all to do with controls. There can be anything from getting the wrong gear, you're trying to go up into fifth gear and you get third gear, or you're trying to slow down and go from fifth gear to third and you end up going into first. Those sort of things are driver faults, depending on the situation. If you're slowing down from fifth and going to first, and that causes the car to dramatically slow down without your brake lights on, and you've got a car behind you, it's a serious fault because they're going to have to slam their brakes on. Um, one of the other ones is staying on the accelerator pedal when you're changing gear. So as you change gear, the revs go vroom, vroom, all the time. If you do it on every single gear change, it's going to become a habit, and it's going to go from being marked in that driver fault column to in that serious column. Steering's another one in there not steering enough, steering too much. You go around a corner and you're swinging out onto the wrong side of the road. Depending on the situation, it could be a driver fault, could be a serious. If there's nobody there and it's a really wide road, it could just be a driver fault. If there's another car coming towards you and they have to take evasive action, it's a serious. Another car coming towards you, the examiner has to slam the brakes on, it's a dangerous. 
So just think about that. It can go in each little column. Uh, the foot brake, the handbrake, um, as you come into a stop, before you fully stop the car, you're putting the handbrake on. Could be a driver fault. If you pull it on at 20 miles an hour, you could lose control of the back end. Could be dangerous. Very simple how those little driver faults can all of a sudden become the serious and the dangerous. Uh, the foot brake, slamming it on all the time, not being nice and progressive and smooth. It doesn't matter if you're a little bit jerky. The examiner knows that you're nervous. You, they're not expecting you to be perfect. But every time you see a light go from green to red and it's a thousand yards in front of you, you slam that brake on. The examiner's constantly going forwards like this. The one, they're going to feel seasick and get a headache. But as far as they're concerned, have you got control of that foot brake? The answer would be no. So depending on the situation, it's going to be marked in either of those three boxes. One of the biggest reasons why people didn't pass their test last year in 2018, and predominantly in this year from the figures that I've seen, is a little box at the top in the middle. And it just says, move off. Now you might think this is quite a simple thing to do. On your driving test, you're going to be asked to stop a minimum of three to four times. They're just going to say to you, find somewhere safe on the left-hand side of the road and pull over for me. You might even be asked to do more if you've got to do the parallel park or they want to stop you before they brief you on doing the controlled stop or something like that. You might have to do more. So there's only two columns on this, safety and control. I want you to change the column title in your own mind from safety to observations because that's what this one's really all about. Control, driver fault, could be something as simple as pulling off and stalling. Serious, pulling off in front of somebody else or pulling off and nearly hitting a car as you pull off in front of you. Something along those sorts of lines could be the difference between a driver fault and a serious fault. But the safety one is where you see most people that this doesn't pass them the driving test. This is where it happens. And it's all to do with your blind spot check. Now, if you're watching this video and you've got your test booked and you don't know what the blind spot check is, have a look into what a blind spot check is in the car because it is vitally important and you need to get that as being a habit. So think about that a little bit. But you have to think about the situation. You're parked on the left-hand side of the road. You're just on a road, you've got no indicator on because you've stopped, your handbrake's on, you're in neutral, so you take your indicator off because then you're parked. You don't need to leave it on, you're sorted. At that point, when you go to move off, how do you know whether it's safe? Because you're looking in your mirrors. However, you're stopped. A cyclist at this point is faster than you. And you might miss them in the middle mirror. And they might be in a certain position that the right-hand mirror doesn't see them. You go to pull off, that cyclist is right next to your driver's side door and you hit them. What do you think the outcome of your driving test is going to be? More importantly, what do you think is going to happen to that cyclist? Is it his fault for what he's done? Well, no. A little pre-point on the next section, signals. How do you know if you need to signal when you're moving off from that side of the road? Because you might have looked in your rear mirror and not seen anybody. You might have looked in that right mirror and not seen anybody. But this cyclist is sat over here, just pootling along, minding his own business. You've not seen him, so you've not put a signal on. If you look over your shoulder and check your blind spot, oh, hello, there's a cyclist there. Signal, let him go, and then you go. Now, men. Please don't take offence to this because I'm a man saying this and I say it to all of my students. When you do your blind spot checks, it is a woman's look, not a man's look. Best example I can give you of this, they've asked you to go into a room and look for something. You go and look for it as a man, you can't find it. Two seconds later, she walks in, walks straight to it and picks it up. Why? Because as men, we glance. Women look. I'm a big, big advocate for this because I used to be an absolute nightmare when I learned to drive because I just literally do that. I'm not even bothering with what's there. I'm just doing it for the sake because I was told to do it. I then realised how important it actually was. So what I do to myself now is when I check my blind spot, if there's nothing there, I say in my head something I see. So there might be a gate over there. There might be a brick wall. And that's a lot of a brick wall. I know in my own head, I've actually looked then. I've not just gone I miss the whacking great big lorry that I'm about to drive into. So make sure you have a proper look. The other point to notice on this one, which is actually something I'm going to come to when it comes to talking about mirrors. When you are asked to stop, you are asked to find somewhere safe. It does not mean stop now. It means you need to plan it. You need to check whether it's safe for you to do it first. And by that, you need to look behind you through your mirrors 
to see if you need to tell anybody that you're pulling over. Because if you just go to pull over, yeah, you put your signal on, fair enough, but you just go to pull over without looking behind you and start to slow down, and there's a car really close up behind you, okay, they might be able to deal with it, but in a slightly different situation, could they? Signals. Very, very simple set of markings for these. It's all about whether you can cause confusion. So think about this. You're driving down a road. There's a bus stopped in front of you. The bus has stopped on the left. You're on a single carriageway road. Directly opposite where the bus has stopped is another junction on your right. If you signal to go around that junction, what does the car behind you think? And ask yourself that question. If you were that car behind, what would you think? You might think, well, they're going around the bus. But you as the car behind them, can you see that bus? And the answer to that will be yes, unless you're in a very big lorry or something in front. But at that point, the car behind you can see the bus. So if you start to move around it, they know what you're doing. They can see what the bus is indicating. They can see the bus. They can see what you're trying to do. If you then put an indicator on, they might think, oh, they're turning up that road. They might not. But it's that potential risk of confusion. So... The way you can get marked on this is signaling too early, signaling too late, not signaling at all, signaling when you shouldn't do. And all of them can cause confusion. You drive up to a roundabout, single lane roundabout, you don't signal at all when you're going onto it and you're actually coming left taking the first exit. So you're not going to affect anybody on the roundabout. But the person coming out of the exit you're going to go down stops because you haven't told them that you're going down that exit so they can actually go. At that point, you've affected that road user because you've not told them what you're doing. Now, granted, you go straight over on a roundabout, you've got no way to signal. But that's what that person might have been thinking you were doing. So if you are going left, put that signal on. Just make sure people know what you're doing. If you're in two lanes and you can't remember if the lane you're in is left only or not, well, there's no harm in that point. You're sat in a queue of traffic putting your signal on. It's not like you're going to stop. You're going to be, that's just you making sure that you're going around the corner properly. So don't be afraid to put it on as long as it's not going to cause confusion. Clearance to obstructions, very, very straightforward. This one is how close you get to certain objects. Park cars, when you're passing them, um, buses if they stop in front of you, other cars at traffic lights when you're having to stop behind them. And it's all to do with realistically here how fast you approach these obstacles or how close you are. The closer you are and the bigger the chance of you actually hitting them, the higher this mark is going to be scored on there for you. Response to signs, traffic signs, road markings, all of these sort of things. You will deal with this throughout the majority of your driving test. So, go in the wrong way in a lane. You've been asked to go straight on. You end up in a lane that goes left only and you go straight on. Well, you've not responded to the road markings and nobody else around you is going to expect you to do that. The potential risk for that is extremely high. Not stopping at a red light. Not going when it turns green. That's one that I've seen a few times that always kind of the students got themselves in a little bit of a world of their own. Yeah, it's on red. Da, 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 da. It goes to green. Da, 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 da. And then you get a honk from the car behind you. At the point that car honks, you've affected him negatively. You go from a driver fault to a serious. I nearly said minor then. See? Even myself, I get myself in the wrong wording sometimes. But it's all about just responding to those street signs, the road markings. So just pay attention to them as you're driving around. If you've been asked to go straight on and you get in a left lane that takes you left only, just go left. It's the safest thing to do at that point. All the examiner is going to say to you is, do you know what? I did actually want you to go that way. Don't worry about it. I'm just going to get you to go down this road and we'll turn around and come back. They cannot mark you down for going the wrong way as long as it is the safest thing to do. So just be careful. If you're in the wrong lane, go the way it takes you. Use of speed. Now, if you look at the driving test report, there is two sections where it says the word speed. Use of speed, and then a little bit later on, it says appropriate speed. This box is all about going too fast. And again, if you do it a couple of times, just go 31 in a 30. Oh, I've realized it come off. You might get marked a couple of driver faults for it. If to 30, 33 35 something like that in a 30 and you are not reducing your speed you've not even realized you're going too fast at that point it basically becomes a serious because you're just not realizing it and then if that speed becomes very dangerous so you go around a really tight corner doing 35 in a 30 where realistically you should have been slowing down before then and the examiner's going way you're going right out of control 
it's going to be a dangerous for you. Following distance, again, this is very sim similar to the clearance to obstructions one. The basic principles of it are, if you are breaking the two second rule, so you're within two seconds of a car in front in the dry conditions, if it's wet, it needs to be double that. If it's snowy, it needs to be 10 times that. But if you are too, following a car too close in front, it is becoming unsafe. To begin with, it'll be a driver fault. If it's persistent and gets closer, then it's gonna just move up to serious. And if it's really, really bad, it's gonna go all the way up to dangerous. Progress. So you'll see in here, it says a box called appropriate speed. If you think use of speed is too fast, you'll be right in thinking that appropriate speed is going too slowly. There is a very fine line between these two. On a 30 mile an hour road, you might be able to quite comfortably and safely do 30, but you might not. It might have traffic calming measures like speed bumps or narrowings or any sort of issues that actually realistically mean you need to use your own nounce, your own noggin and think a little bit and go, hmm, isn't quite safe to do 30 here. I'm going to wind my speed back a little bit just so I can take a bit more control. But let's say you do that where there's a load of parked cars on a really long straight road that's 30 miles an hour. So you drop your speed back through the parked cars, absolutely spot on. You then go past the parked cars. You can see there isn't any coming up in front of you and you still stick at a reduced speed without any attempt to bring that speed back up. That is where you'll get marked down for being too slow because at that point, everybody else around you is going to expect you to do 30. Dual carriageways, motorways. Now, you're never going to be taken on a motorway on your driving test because it's not something they test. It's just too hard for every test centre to be able to get to a motorway on every test. But a dual carriageway, national speed limit roads. Maximum speed, which you should know this if you've passed your theory, is 70 miles an hour. If you drive up that road at 40 miles an hour, you are becoming an extremely dangerous rolling roadblock. And also, your confidence is going to go through the floor because all you're going to think is the car's going past, you're going to go jump, 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 and it's going to really put pressure on you. If you just push yourself and get yourself at least to 60 miles an hour, you'll notice the cars don't go jump, 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 jump past you now, unless they're being an idiot and doing 100. Everybody that's doing roughly the speed limit will just go hmm, nice and slowly past you. And it all of a sudden feels a lot calmer on a dual carriageway. But if you go too slow, you are causing a massive problem and that's where it becomes very dangerous. So appropriate speed is quite important. The other box in this one is undue hesitation. That is what it says. Sitting at a junction when you've got plenty of opportunities to move out nice and safely and you just sit there. If you just sit there and miss opportunities and you've got no cars behind you, you're looking at a driver fault, possibly a couple, depending on how it is. If you've got a big stream of traffic behind you, it becomes a serious. If you stop and are hesitant at a massive multi-lane roundabout that the lights are on green, well, that's response to traffic signs as well, but it could be marked in this, that then becomes dangerous. Junctions, lots of different categories in here. It basically boils down to, say to my students, would you do junctions with your eyes shut? And the answer is always the same, no. So why aren't you looking as you approach it? And they go, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you've just sat there like that, staring forwards and there's no looking at what's coming down the road. You're coming out of a road. There's no looking at it at all. So effectively, you've done that junction with your eyes shut because you've not looked. You've not been observant. So with your junctions, make sure your approach speed is good. If you go at it too fast and the examiner's thinking, whoa, hang on, they're not gonna stop. That's when they're at the risk of putting that control down to take control back from you because they don't feel that you're in control. Junctions don't cut people up. Make sure you're observant. And on the same instance, don't be too hesitant. It's a very fine line on that one. Okay, so judgments. Well, the judgment section basically works around how you meet, greet, and cross other traffic and overtake people. And that includes overtaking cyclists. And this, again, all comes down to a very simple set of questions you need to ask yourself. Do I feel like I'm squeezing through a gap? Do you have that urge as you go past to go, I was a bit close there? Because if you do, you shouldn't be going through it or you should be going through it slower. So you either have to give yourself one of two things when it comes to dealing with the judgment section of the test. You need to give yourself more space. And if you can't give yourself more space because it's not your right of way or you're on a one way street that's got cars parked on both sides, you need to give yourself more time. So you need to slow down. And if you can do both, brilliant. That helps you out a little bit. But it's the whole thing of, if you're going around a section of parked cars, 
and they're on your side of the road and there is no obstruction on the other side of the road, it is the person coming towards you that has right of way. So if by you going around those parked cars, you cause that car to stop that's coming towards you, you'd negatively affect them. You shouldn't have done that. That would be marked then down as a serious fault. If you just get a little bit close to some of these, it could go down in the clearance and obstructions. It could go down in this section, it depends. Again, overtaking a cyclist. You go around a cyclist and pull really quick back in front of them so you're not giving them any room, causing the cyclist to possibly go, oh, hang on, I'm gonna give this person a bit of a space here. You've not given them enough space as you've gone around them. That again could potentially be a driver fault, a serious or a dangerous depending on the situation. And crossing traffic is when you're pulling out in front of people. So if you're at the end of a road and you're wanting to turn right, you've got to cross the lane of traffic that's coming from your right because you're going into the traffic that's coming from your left. So these people that are coming from your right, if you just pull out and they have to slam their brakes on and stop, you've affected them. That's where you're going to be getting marks. And this goes through the whole test is don't bully other drivers. Don't force your way through things. Don't force what you want to do on somebody else. Because whenever you're going to do that, the chances of you getting marked in any of these areas is going to be extremely high. Part of the other thing of this, giving way unnecessarily. You're driving down a road, car in front of you is wanting to turn into a road on your left. So they want to come across your path. It's your right of way. If you get yourself a bit confused and just stop, well, the cars behind you aren't going to know why you've stopped. They just think, whoa, they've stopped. But that car coming towards you that wants to come down this road hasn't got right of way. You're on the main road. You need to take control and just carry on going. Again, this is where if you're too hesitant, you ease off the gas really early because you think, oh, they might come across from me. They're not, and you're not really sure. And you get yourself slowing down and slowing down and then stop in the middle of a 30 mile an hour road, 40 mile an hour road, whatever it might be. That's going to potentially be, it, you'd be very lucky if that was a driver fault. It's more than likely going to be a serious or a dangerous position. So you've got normal driving and lane discipline. Ask yourself a very, very simple question. That if you've passed your theory test and you've done a bit of research on the road, should be able to answer this question very, very simply. If I have a choice of two or more lanes, which lane should I be in? And imagine all the lanes go the same way. You've got two lanes, you've got three lanes, you've got four lanes. Which lane is your normal driving position? Not when you're overtaking and not when you're turning right. But every single else, rest of the time, where should you be? If your answer to that is anything other than be in the left lane, it was incorrect. Now, there are certain times when you can't be in the left lane. If it's a bus lane, if you've been instructed to go straight on and the left lane is left only, then you move into the next lane. Not all the way out, not into lane three, lane four, whatever it is. But you stay in the left hand most lane that is safe for you to be in. If you need to overtake, you go into your next lane across, you overtake, and then you come back again. Your aim is to always go for that left lane. So you can get marked down for this one. If you're on a dual carriageway that you've overtaken a vehicle and then they've kind of eased back underneath you a little bit, you've picked up your speed and then moved back across, you could get a driver fault in use of speed for not going quick enough, or you could get a driver fault for staying in the right-hand lane too long. If you go onto a dual carriageway in the right-hand lane and stay throughout the entire duration without overtaking a single car, or even if you overtake a couple of them, if you go down a dual carriageway for a mile, two miles, and you just sit in that right-hand lane with no attempt to get back into your left lane, you will then get a serious for being in the wrong position for too long. So always try and aim for your left lane. If your left lane turns into a left-only lane and it's not safe for you to move back over into the middle lane number two, lane number three, whichever one it might be. Just stay in it and go that way. Again, go the wrong way. You've done it safely. Lane discipline. Sometimes, well, this applies to dual carriageways, roundabouts, anything like that where you've got multi-lanes to deal with. And lane discipline is all about staying in the lane that you're in unless you are letting everybody else know what you're doing and you're being very observant about changing lanes. So let's imagine you're on a dual carriageway and you want to overtake the car in front. 
if you were just to drift across that lane without looking, without signalling, without any realisation that you actually intend to change lanes, that's drifting out of your lane. And that's going to get you either a driver fault, or if there's a car in there that you affect, it could be a serious fault or it could be a dangerous fault. Just drifting into lanes, if the situation's correct, it could be a serious fault. Same on a roundabout. You go into a roundabout in the, let's say, lane number two, if it's a three lane roundabout. And as you go onto it, you realise you should be in lane number one and you just drift back over without looking. What's the examiner going to do? The first thing they're going to do is make sure that it's safe. So they're going to look for you. You've not done it. They're going to do it. Their responsibility is to keep you safe. At the point that they look, you might go, oh, I should have looked. Then you look, well, it's a bit late then. Should have done it before. You're already halfway in the lane now. So if you're on a multi-lane roundabout, be very careful about changing lanes unless you've double checked it safe before you even move. So you have a good look, signal, and a good look again, just as you're moving, just to make sure that you're 100%. You've got a massive blind spot areas on roundabouts especially to try and get your lane right before you get there but don't drift lanes without intending to do it pedestrian crossings this section now generally reverts to zebra crossings because a lot of the other crossings are related to in your response to traffic signs traffic lights it's in that section so this one realistically deals with zebra crossings so again Ask yourself the question, what's the rule on a zebra crossing? They do go to cross it or they are stood at the edge of it. You must treat that zebra crossing like a red light if it is safe to do so. Position, normal stops. Ironically, this is another area where a lot of people can get the test a little bit squiff. Because you are going to be asked to stop quite a few times. So your potential for getting driver faults in this and then them becoming habits and going to serious are quite high. So a driver fault is going to be you've stopped somewhere where you're a little bit over a driveway and it just might be the front of the car or a little bit of the back of the car. It's not perfect. It's not brilliant, but you're not affecting anybody negatively for the time that you're going to be staying there. So that would get you a driver fault. Um, you might also have stopped a little bit too far away from the curb. Might have just brushed it a little bit. So again, it's just your stopping position wasn't perfect, but it's not the end of the world. A serious would be stopping on a double yellow line stopping on school markings if it's in the time that those school markings are in effect stopping on a single yellow line if you're in the time frame when those single yellow lines are in effect stopping across a junction blocking somebody's driveway all these sort of things where you think to yourself do you know what i shouldn't be stopping here generally that's where this is going to move into a serious driver fault or if it's a really bad place and it's on double yellow lines, or even if you're taking your test through a city centre that's on the red route, which has the double red lines, that could be a dangerous because they are no stopping at all. So just when you're asked to stop, you are asked to find somewhere safe to stop. So plan it yourself. Don't just stop now. Look for your space, pick it, check if you need to signal, get yourself over and get yourself stopped. That's it. It's one of the most important sections in your driving test. And that is your awareness and planning section. If you're not aware of what's going on around you and you don't plan for the obstacles coming up in front of you, you are going to get marks all over the place on your driving test. So you need to be highly aware of what's coming on in front of you. And the examiner's instructions are always going to help you with this because they're going to tell you at the roundabout, I want you to go this way. You might not well see the roundabout because it might be just over the dip of a bridge or over a hill. Take the next road on the what? on the left take the next road on the right you know the next road that's coming up you are going to have to turn down so plan it like i said earlier with the bus you're following a bus down a road which has got bus stops on it and you see somebody stood at it down the road past the bus the chances of that bus stopping are somewhere around about 90 percent so plan for it drop yourself back move yourself towards the white line a little bit and then if the bus puts its signal on, start thinking, oh, there's nothing coming. I've got plenty of opportunity to keep my speed going and just gently move around them. Or you might have another car coming towards you, so you can just let off the gas a little bit, reduce that speed, and just then pop in your gap that you created for yourself. The more you plan and the more you're aware of on your test, the easier your driving is going to be. And this is something that you need to take into your driving once you've passed your test. 
Awareness and planning is the difference between a good, safe driver and what I class as a near miss or very unnerving driver when you're sat as a passenger. If you've ever sat in a car as a passenger and you've touched the imaginary brake, and by that what I mean is you've pushed into the carpet with your right foot as if you're braking thinking, why aren't they slowing down? They really need to slow down. That is them not being aware of it and not planning it. And as a passenger, you feel that. So if you do it with the amount of experience you've had, how do you think an examiner that's done this for a few years and is used to sitting in that position, feeling and watching what drivers are doing as they are approaching these things, the earlier you are aware of something and the earlier you plan it, the more relaxed, the more comfortable the examiner is going to feel. And likewise, the less marks you're going to get. In this one, your marks that you're going to get is all to do with if you just drive up behind the bus. It's had its indicator on for a little while. You've been able to see the passenger stood at the side of the road. It's been very obvious and you might be on a little two lane dual carriageway where you've had plenty of opportunity to go past the bus. You've just ignored it, waited for him to stop and then stopped behind him and sat there. That's no awareness or no planning. You've just dealt with it at the last second. When you don't show awareness and when you don't plan, it brings in one of my pet hates for people on driving test, which is that feeling of them rushing it because everything comes at you at last minute and it's nothing to do with your speed. It's to do with the fact that what you're doing is not giving yourself the time to react to things. So you're not planning them in advance. You are dealing with them once they've happened rather than planning for them to happen and then being ready to deal with it. It's a very different scenario. But feeling rushed, doing everything late, gives the examiner, and actually you should feel this a little bit yourself if you're aware of what you're doing, you would feel out of control. Planning and being aware of what's going on around you is what gives your passenger and you that sense that you are in control of the car. And finally, I know this has been a long-winded video. There's a lot to go through on this, which is why I'm really, really appreciative of the fact that you've stayed and watched to the end, because hopefully you'll take a loss away from this video. Your final point is ancillary controls. Okay, This is where they mark you on the show me questions, which are the seven that are done on the move. If you're not sure what they are, go and check my video out on the show me questions and it'll go through them all for you. Now these are done on the move. So what you're scored on here, the driver fault is if you don't operate it correctly. Basically, you might operate the rear one instead of the front one, whatever it might be. Your serious fault though, is what happens to your drive whilst you're trying to operate it. So if you've forgotten, for example, your front windscreen washes, you've forgotten how to operate them, and whilst you're driving down the road, you then do that and go, oh, where is it? I can't really remember. And while you're doing that, your hand's just lifting a little bit. And before you know it, we drift just about to the wrong side of the road. And then you go, oh, hang on, realise it. Pull it back. That's going to get you a serious mark. If you don't realise it and the examiner has to pull you back with themselves, that's going to be a dangerous mark. So that's basically how this works with the driving test. Thank you very much for watching guys. Like I say, I do apologize for this being a little bit of a long winded video. It is just one of those things that we've got to do. And it was in an idea that a student gave to me. And I do think it's a very worthwhile time that you've spent watching this. I do hope it's been helpful. I wish you every success in your driving test. I hope that you pass. Don't worry if you don't pass first time, just make sure that you use it as that learning tool and then go and get yourself passed the next time. Good luck with everything. Thank you very much for watching. If this is your first time coming to this channel, do make sure that you subscribe to the channel up here. Turn that notification bell on so you don't miss any of the future videos I've got coming on. Hopefully now the children are going back to school next week, I will be able to keep on top of these videos doing them once a week. So I do apologize for that. If you do want to see any of the other videos, like I said, I'm going to have a couple of the other videos popping up at the end here where you can go back and have a look at some of the previous stuff that I've done. You've got the show me, tell me videos. You've got how to deal with your nerves. There is loads and loads of stuff on the channel. So do make sure you go and check them out. Watch whatever you like. If you do like them, chuck us a big thumbs up. And if you think it's been helpful or you've got any comments, mm -hmm. drop them in the comments down below for me. Thank you very much. See you later. <laughs>
Thank you.